Bangladesh is a country surrounded with water. It's the delta of some of the greatest rivers in South Asia, the Ganges, the Brahmaputra, and the Meghna. It is also one of the poorest and most populated places on Earth. In the wet season, it is often flooded, and in the dry months, there are water shortages due to upstream damming and increasing impacts of climate change. However, if these conditions were not enough of a challenge, around half of Bangladesh's rural population are now at risk from arsenic-contaminated drinking water, what the World Health Organization has described as the largest mass poisoning of a population in history. In the 1970s and 80s, in an effort to address the shortages of clean drinking water, international aid agencies financed the sinking of around 5 million shallow tube wells across the country. Unfortunately, no one at the time realised that many of these shallow aquifers were contaminated with arsenic. This red marked well indicates that it is arsenic contaminated and has been abandoned. Arsenic contamination of Bangladesh's underground aquifers came with the sediments that eroded from the Himalayan mountains and accumulated in this delta many million years ago. There has been a number of surveys since arsenic was first detected in Bangladesh back in 1993. We have done uh, a lot of work since then. Now we have a clear idea about the controls, particularly the geological controls on occurrence of arsenic, both in terms of spatial distribution and in vertical, uh, in terms of vertical distribution. Uh, in terms of spatial distribution, uh, Bangladesh is a vast flat plain, but there are some older plains, the Pleistocene uplands. We haven't found any arsenic in the Pleistocene uplands. All arsenic, what we have found, are found in the recent Holocene plains mainly in the flood plains and deltaic plains of the major river systems, the Ganges, Brahmaputra and Magna. In terms of vertical distribution, what we have seen, arsenic is found only in the upper or shallow aquifer, which is composed of Holocene alluvium, which are grey in colour and contains a large amount of organic matter. When you go deeper into the Pleistocene sediments, which are reddish brown in colour and contains lower amount of organic matter, those are basically arsenic safe. The government has gone around uh, most of the places in Bangladesh to test the wells and to paint the contaminated wells red and the uncontaminated wells green. More than 20% of the wells uh, of about more than 10 million wells, those are being used in Bangladesh as drinking water sources. At least 20% of them have arsenic above the Bangladesh standard of 50 microgram per liter. If you consider the WHO standard of 10 microgram per liter, this may go up to 50% of the existing wells. So we are talking about a large proportion of wells. And there are various estimates about the people exposed to arsenic. Uh, there are estimates, uh, the most conservative one shows that about 21 million people are exposed to arsenic. And the highest uh, one uh, estimates go up to 60 million people are exposed. So we are talking about a large proportion of the uh, population exposed to high arsenic in their drinking water. <laughs> When you go to the problem areas, uh, there are two ways of immediate solution. First of, first of all, we have to test the wells properly. And if we find safe well and unsafe wells, and if you can mark them, then people can switch to safe wells from unsafe wells. This is one way of providing mitigation. In the areas where we cannot find safe wells, we have to look for alternative solutions. This alternative solution could be either deeper groundwater or treated surface water or even rainwater. The shallow aquifers at Kumabog village, south of the capital Dhaka, are contaminated with arsenic. A team of researchers from the Arsenic Mitigation and Research Foundation have been working here for some years. They installed this deep tube well in the village as a means of providing arsenic-free water. Dr. Masood runs a clinic in the village that treats arsenic poisoning. 
This is a very big village. Around about uh, 12,000 people are there. But the bad luck is that 90% of the tubers, the shallow tubers, are having arsenic contamination. And you see the, uh, the nearest uh, place where, from where they can uh, bring water, that might be more than two kilometers or three kilometers. But in our country, culturally, the main user of water is the woman. Look at the, at the side of the tubal. The, all the women are coming with their pots to take the drink water. So it's very difficult for them to, to go two and three kilometers away and bring a better water. So we decided to have a tubal here and that will fit at least, at least uh, 400 household. And look at the girls, around the clock there are more than 300 women coming and taking their water from here. Our objective is not that just giving them the tea wells. Our objective is to empower them. So uh, side by side with the awareness about arsenic contamination, we are installing a few deep tea wells so that at the ins instantly they can get some uh, water for safe drinking. And they, they have got their own committee. The people, they for form a committee, a, a, a people of seven or 10 people. Uh, women and men are there. Then uh, it's the beginning of the organization, you know. Our objective is that the people of this village, they form their own organization, that's the people's organization, and they seek, they find out the alternative to the contaminated water. There are two objectives. The first objective is to give them clean drinking water um, directly because they need it now. All the other wells here are polluted. And the second objective is that you use the installation of a well as a, as a trigger, a way to mobilize the people to get them together to talk about their problems. And um, on the long term, it's very well possible that these wells will not be safe anymore because the arsenic might, um, might go to the deeper water levels where this well gets its water from. And um, in the future, then you'll need to look at other technologies as well that might solve the problem at that time. And we hope by, that by that time, if we start now with mobilizing the committee and getting these groups organized, that they will be able to shift to a new technology when those become available and if these are not safe on the long term. So it's those two objectives, provide clean drinking water on the short term and uh, use it as a, as a trigger to organize the committee, the, the mob, uh, to, to organize the community to, um, to uh, look for longer term solutions if necessary. However, one of the problems now facing this village is that many of its members who were exposed to arsenic in the 10 to 15 years before a safe tube well had been installed are now beginning to show symptoms of arsenic poisoning. Uh, actually, uh, his complaint is tremendous itching, you know, sometimes it itches like anything. And it burns also, you know, it, a feeling of burning sensation. Huh? And overall, a discomfort, a body discomfort, because skin is such an organ that it is always with the environment. It is in contact with the environment. When they have got these symptoms, there are, there are problems with burning, eating that increases, sweating that increases. So at this moment he has got that. But anyway, these poor people, you know, at this level of socioeconomic conditions, there were so many other diseases too. So sometimes for them it is very difficult to differentiate with the arsenicosis problem and the other problem. And that is the point where we have to look at the patients and isolate the symptoms of arsenicosis and others. So in any way, when you treat this arsenicosis patient, we have to look after the other problems they have. Why it is scattered? Actually, still, if you say the treatment of this arsenicosis condition, there is no definite treatment of that. But what we found with last uh, all, all the studies and experiments, that few vitamins works fine to detoxicate the arsenic from the blood or from the organs of the body. Uh, one is ascorbic acid, there's a vitamin C, there's a folic acid, and a vitamin E and vitamin A. So we started uh, treating them with these vitamins, but side by side, the, our, the, uh, we always ask them to have more vegetables. 
And you know, just by telling vegetables, if you advise them, you take more and more vegetables. And sometimes it, it, it looks like that advising these sort of words to a very, very poor person who cannot even buy the vegetables. So sometimes it becomes zero when you <laughs> ask them to take more, take more and more vitamins. Anyway, we do it. And what we're now doing that we have listed all these patients and going for biological test, like from here or so nails, so that we can find out the stages where they are. And if there is any organic affections, so and, and next stage will be to treat the patient to detoxicate arsenic from the organs. She said, we don't take this contaminated water for one and a half year. And she said that for the last one and a half year, the, the, the spots, the skin, lesions are a bit improved, a bit improved. Might be that uh, she has stopped taking the uh, water for one and a half year. And moreover, now I'm just looking externally because in this situation you cannot see, you cannot examine the whole body. But they have got those uh, lesions in the in the in their body also. But we cannot show it here. Right, right. Look at it. One of the first steps in these villages is to talk about the arsenic and to discuss the problems related to arsenic in order to motivate the people to, to work together to do something about it and to organize a committee and all these things. Um, so, but one of the first obstacles that you cross is that um, people are not aware of the arsenic, of what it is and what the effects can be, especially in villages where you don't see the external symptoms. So there might be a lot of internal problems, but where the villagers cannot see any external skin problems because of the arsenic, there, there's uh, first the first step is already quite difficult. Providing educational support at the Kumabog village has been crucial to addressing the arsenic problem here. Many of its members are illiterate, and therefore information about arsenic contamination needs to be communicated through practical examples. This education program also focuses on the women of the community who are responsible for providing water and food for their families. One important initiative has been the establishment of an office in the village, where information on the arsenic problem is explained to village women in graphic and effective terms. <laughs> So what we do when our staff goes every day in the village talking about the arsenic, its contamination and its consequences, so they get our... On the other hand, the people themselves also come to this centre from the, around the village. So it is not only a project office, it's also a centre of information. The people do come over here to know about it, what is our project, what is our activities. So. Well, our, one of the objectives is to mainstreaming the arsenic issue with other programs. So we talk with the other NGOs and we give the message that please, when you go to talk about other things, please give some messages about the arsenic. The government has taken a few initiatives as well to try to install some safe water options in the villages, but usually it goes through all the processes of the administration, local administration, down to the local government. And the result is that those, those uh, deep tube wells, for example, that the government installs, they end up in the hands of the family or the brother or the uncle of the local union chairman um, with the intention that it should be shared, but in the end it doesn't happen. There are so many examples of this happening. Not only government programs, but let's say most of the top-down initiatives, the technologies that they install end up in the wrong hands and not as a benefit for the whole community. Great. A good example of the failure of past international efforts to address the Arctic problem can be seen at the nearby village of Bashar, where UNICEF funded the building of these rainwater tanks and a number of dug wells. The problem with this dug well is that people are not using it, they're not maintaining it, and um, our staff did a 
short study here to look at why those those um, installations have failed and how and why people are not using them anymore. Um, there's no maintenance of the wells um, and some of the other installations like the rainwater tank. Um, those um, provide water for a few months during the rainy season and uh, that water is just enough for maybe one or two families to take during the rainy season, uh, which doesn't make it a very suitable option for, for, a community, um, uh, for a community to use as a whole. So in that sense it doesn't work. And some of the rainwater harvesting tanks also need some kind of special maintenance to keep them clean and people are not willing to do that either. So there are several factors why, why these, these uh, solutions in this village have, haven't, haven't worked at all. And uh, have actually also sometimes frustrated the process because they end up being installed at um, some of the more influential villagers, which uh, in the beginning of the process they, they say, sure, we will share this installation with the community. And after a while, maybe after realizing the, the implications of that, that all the villagers will come to their place to get water and realizing that there isn't enough water, they, they stop uh, sharing that installation with other people. UNICEF themselves now have entered a new phase in their program and they're going to stop installing rainwater tanks for all those reasons of maintenance and different reasons. When, when we import technology and we don't think on the basis of the local demands or local needs, it ends to like that. So it is such type of technology, it is viable for other countries, but not for one of these, because here we have got two months rain, and it can contain only two months rain water. And people of Bangladeshi culturally, culturally uh, are used to use water every time. This life is with water. So they've got a very clear, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, e e habit of using it. So they don't, they don't take it. They say, okay, look on the sunset. There are some dirt, this and that. It is going inside and it becomes dirty. And you see, after some time, there's some small insect inside. So it's not possible to use it. Oh, better the canal water is fine. Okay, sometimes but, uh, they it used is, to. You are using this pipe. Yeah. It is already damaged, but nobody uh, coming for repair it. Okay, I, I, I think uh, it's the wrong. Maximum so, you, so you many times uh, uh, some uh, Bangladeshi people and uh, foreigners are coming, yeah. but it is not. Uh, uh, they are not um, uh, preparing new uh, new preparing. Uh, first time they uh, they made it, but uh, no, nobody coming for repair it. Uh. He was telling, okay, somebody who donated it, they are not coming to repair it. That means the community has not empowered or not handed over. Community does not own it. Somebody has given it. So it is their responsibility to maintain. It is no more our uh, duty. So two, one is they don't have the demand. They don't have the demand. They are not culturally accepting this. And number two, they can use if they, those people come back again and maintain it. So that was the problem, the installing some technology, that it is people are not empowered to take it. So there's a failure of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, problem of uh, sustenance of a program. And it's totally, uh, the, in that sense, it is not sustainable because people did not take over. People don't own it at all. Despite well-intentioned efforts on the part of international agencies, Access to safe drinking water remains a daily struggle for almost half of Bangladesh's 130 million people. This water was very, very uh, pure and um, uh, uh, free of arsenic. Maybe we are uh, getting water from now, uh, sometimes the, um, uh, another, another uh, arsenic-free uh, uh, tube well. Ah. And uh, we are now taking from the, the tank, yeah, UNICEF tank, and uh, sometimes we are uh, using this uh, uh, this pond water and uh, and reverse water, and we are uh, um, uh, using it uh, by uh, um, boiling. In an effort to provide access to clean water in Bangladesh and other developing countries, technology such as the shallow tube well is now seen as something of a mixed blessing. Some would say it simply adds insult to injury in delivering arsenic poisoning to people who are already some of the poorest in the world. It has also made arsenic poisoning a global problem. 
uh, if you look into the literature, there are published literature of arsenic occurrence from at least 50 countries in the world on all the continents. So this is a global problem. I think the effort, international effort is not enough yet to make public more aware of that. WHO, uh, they have published these uh, guideline things, but uh, I think uh, there are needs for more activities for creating awareness. Another issue, major issue is the lack of uh, facilities in the developing part of the world, like in Bangladesh or in Nepal, even we cannot analyze water properly. So these are the major issues. If you want to confront arsenic, we need to develop local capacity. There is no lack of manpower, but there is lack of trained manpower and facilities like laboratory facilities and other analytical facilities. So international effort should be uh, directed to those areas for uh, confronting arsenic globally and also in countries like Bangladesh, Nepal or any other developed part of the world. It is a paradox for these people living in the delta of some of the world's greatest rivers that access to clean and safe drinking water has become such a problem. It is also a stark reminder of the harsh realities of global poverty.